Thank you, kids, for singing, for smiling. It's good. <clears throat> Let's take our Bibles together to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26 in the Old Testament. Or I can just say Isaiah, if that helps you. I Isaiah. I think one of these days I'm going to put a camera up here and I'm just going to record you as you watch the kids sing and then I'm going to show it back to you one day, okay? It's fantastic to see it. See, I know you can smile because I watch it then. You frown during the preaching, but you smile during the singing, so. <laughs> Isaiah chapter number 26. This is in the Bible what is referred to as the major prophets. In other words, this is one of the, the few in the Old Testament uh, prophets that are quite long in scope. And um, this, is, uh, this is a great book. I challenge you as believers, if you've not taken the time over the years to read through the book of Isaiah, that you do that and just read it slowly. There might be much that you're not aware of as far as how things worked with certain nations that he refers to here, but the, the principles in Isaiah are, are wonderful uh, for the child of God. Notice with me Isaiah 26, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name, and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth... The inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer as we start here today. And now, our Father, we bow once again and we thank you for uh, the, the reading of your word here. As we approach this topic this morning, I pray that it be helpful for us as your children. Thank you, Lord, for being very clear in the Bible about what you think about things. And then, Lord, in your kindness that you've given it to us in our language that we can understand it. So, Spirit of God, work amongst us, we pray, and we would certainly ask, Lord, if there's anyone here today who needs Jesus Christ to, to save them from their sin, that they wouldn't leave this building without knowing that they're on their way to heaven. Help them, Lord, to understand the truth of the gospel and to be saved, and we pray it now in Jesus' name, amen. Israel is in turmoil. Uh, for years now, the people of God had lived among their captors in Babylon. They were the object of contempt, if you have studied any of the Old Testament. They were mocked for their belief in God, and particularly a God who that was apparently incapable of delivering them from enslavement. Uh, sing to us one of the songs of Zion, their captors said. Well, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, was their reply. This was Israel. But in due time, over a period of years, the, the captive nation was now humbled. And the prayer of Solomon so many years ago was now going to be answered. If in their captivity they repent and they pray and they return with all of their heart, Solomon prayed. Then he said to God, hear their prayer and maintain their cause. And he said, forgive them of their sin. Isaiah prophesied of this time, as we've read here, when the, when the people would be restored back to their land in the nation of Israel. Verse number one, in this day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. But now for Israel, life had radically changed. Many years ago now, they had been overthrown their loved ones had died. All that they possessed had been stolen from them or burned up. 
They were taken in chains to a far off land to remain as captives. And this wasn't the, the gradual change that we oftentimes expect as we go through seasons of life. This was a radical upheaval. This was a rude interruption of life that they had ex experienced. And in the middle of all of that, God is telling them as a, as a people that a calmness and a peace was not only possible, it was actually the normal way they were supposed to view life. You know, all of us as believers today will go through, through such things in life. Maybe not captivity, maybe not chains, but certainly times of subtle and sometimes radical upheaval. If you're not careful, you know what change does is uh, change steals your hope. Uh, change can rob you of your joy. Uh, some sort of a radical shift, it can alter your focus. In these past weeks, I've been speaking with many of you as a church family and just individually talking about your lives. And it's evident that there's a number here that are going through such things in their lives. Times of trouble, you're facing change, maybe fears of the unknown. Some of you are in hardships and even fearful possibilities, what ifs. So I would like you to see here, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I'd like you to see the need for an undisturbed peace. I would just want you to understand that, that you and I as believers, we have a need for an undisturbed peace. That will keep him in perfect peace, Isaiah said. Now, the fact that we have a need for such peace in our lives, it implies that there's distress or that there's, there's worry, that there's an unsettling, there's this pressure, there's an anxiety that you face in life, and it, and it clouds the heart and the mind. And did you know that there's a consequence to worry? When you live in anxiety, do you understand the consequences to that? When you go through such times in your life and you, allowed it, you allow it to cloud your life and your mind, it, it will affect your marriage. Oh, certainly. There's a distance that's created between you and your spouse and it disconnects you from each other, not because there's a conflict between the two of you, but maybe there's a conflict with you that's unresolved before the Lord and it can create distance in your marriage. When you face upheaval and stress and anxiety and worry and, and uh, the problems that come with life, oftentimes it causes an instability in your home. Either mom or dad is frustrated and short-tempered because of the stress. Worry and anxiety, it affects the mood, doesn't it? Come on, we're just being honest. If you live an anxious life, it affects your mood and your spirit. It affects your health. It affects your sleep. But more than that, you know what it does? It affects your spiritual life. Living under such anxiety and stress and what we find is that we're focusing on the stressful pressures of life and we're not focusing on the Lord. So I said to you as we look at this verse, verse number three, that will keep him in perfect peace. We, as believers, we have the need of an uninterrupted peace. And Jesus said it this way in John 16, These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Uh, he was saying, you have need of peace. And so I've spoken these things, Jesus said to you, that you might have peace. Uh, can I ask you today as a, as a Christian, do you have confidence in God? Now, hear me carefully. I'm not asking you intellectually. Many of us were raised in church. Many of you have been here for many years. Uh, you've heard the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Intellectually, you know the facts of the Bible. I'm not asking you on an intellectual level. I'm asking you on a real heart level. Do you, as a Christian, have confidence in God? A Judah here had lost their home. They'd lost everything that was dear to them. They'd lost their honor as people. And yet their confidence wasn't shaken. In the book of Lamentations... Jeremiah writes this. We sang it earlier this morning. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Do you understand it's not just enough to have peace with God. You need to have the peace of God in your life. We have a need for an uninterrupted peace. But if you'll notice in verse number 3 of chapter 26, Isaiah says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Do you understand that God does the work there? He says, Thou, God, you, uh, you will keep him in perfect peace. And as with everything else in the Christian life, if there's anything of value and anything that lasts in our life, it's God that does the work. The peace that we have comes from God. Uh, You know, the peace that we need in life, in the seasons of turmoil and stress, it doesn't come from a bottle. The peace that you need in life doesn't come from sexual gratification and fulfillment. It doesn't come from medication. Peace doesn't come from spending. It doesn't come from earning. Peace doesn't come from eating and entertainment. All of the things that we do because we think it's going to help us in some way in our life. Jesus said it this way in John 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives... Jesus said, I'm giving you something different. It's my peace that you need. God that does the work. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. You know, he's called the Prince of Peace for a reason. When Isaiah prophesied of the coming Savior, he will be called the Prince of Peace. And he's called that for a reason. And I think that the reason that so many Christians can't find the peace of God in their life is because they're trying to find peace apart from God. And they go through their life with no peace. And yet, do you recall what Jesus said in John 15? I, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. We all know the verse. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, Jesus said, ye can do nothing. You can't have peace apart from Christ. And I speak to you as friends in Christ, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. If you don't have peace in your life, it's probably because you're seeking peace apart from Christ. You're trying to find a remedy or a solution to the stress and the worry and the anxiety and the pressures which are common to life. But you're trying to find it apart from the Lord. You think of Paul and Silas. So here they are in Philippi, beat half to death for their testimony of faith in Christ, thrust into the inner part of the prison in chains for their belief in Christ, and at midnight they sang praises to God. How could they have such a response to the trial? Well, they had peace with God. We sing the song, It is well with my soul. But I think a a lot of times we just lie when we sing it. Because it's really not. We live without peace. And notice it's God that keeps you there. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. You know, it's not a place that you visit from time to time. Peace is supposed to be the normal part of the Christian life. Peace. Have you read through Paul's epistles when he, when he either writes or closes the epistle? He usually says this. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just a fancy way of starting a letter. It's not just something he he wrote to fill space in a letter. He was saying God's peace is with you. It's for you. It's meant for you. You're supposed to live in peace. And that word keep, when Isaiah talks about it, saying, God, God, thou wilt keep. The word keep means to protect. It it means to, uh, to guard. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Same word, same meaning. Guard, protect. And God is saying here, I I will protect your heart. I will protect your peace. I I will preserve you in peace. But God says, I have to do that work. You know, you don't have to hold yourself there, is what he's saying. God keeps you protected and sheltered in a place of peace. But see, this is where I see my responsibility. Would you look again with me in this verse? Verse number three, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Here's the responsibility whose mind is stayed on thee. It's one thing for us to say, well, God, you promised to do this. Uh, God, I've got this great promise that I'm going to have peace in my life, and I don't currently possess peace in my life. So I say, God, you must have failed. The Bible is obviously not true. God is obviously unconcerned with my life. It's not really real. 
But we miss the point where God says, you have the responsibility. Here's where my responsibility comes in and where the battle is really fought when it comes to this matter of peace. I've got to lean my mind upon God. When it says, whose mind is stayed upon thee, a stay is a prop. That's what the word means. So God says, you, your mind needs to be leaned or propped up against me. Your mind has to be fixed on me. Now, if it's true in the Bible that Jesus said that in the world ye shall have tribulation, if that's really true, then we know that, that trials and difficulties are the normal part of life. We fool ourselves as believers many times because what we say is, uh, obviously, there's something wrong because there's something wrong in my life. Now, didn't God promise me that everything was going to be great? And the answer to that is no. There's no promise in Scripture to the New Testament believer that when you get saved, your life will be free of trial and, and difficulty. All of us wish that we had such an easy life. I wish it oftentimes myself. You know, I wish the car would start every morning. You know what I mean? I wish that the heater wouldn't break down. You know, I wish that my big toe didn't hurt. I, I wish that at the age of 51, I could get out of bed and it didn't hurt to get out of bed. When did that happen? I wish that this wasn't the case in my life. Whatever. I, I wish that it wasn't so busy. I wish that we had more money than we have. I wish we could take more holidays. I wish that there wasn't this sickness in my family. Whatever the case may be, God never promised that you're going to have a life that's free of trouble. But he did say you can have peace in the middle of all of it. And the battle is fought here in the mind. When we talk about anxiety, we need to understand the remedy for anxiety is where the mind rests. What is my mind focused on? Peter said it this way in 1 Peter in chapter 1. Wherefore, he said, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, uh, buckle up your mind, he said. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that's brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Get your mind fixed and focused on the right thing. And you got to understand, this is the one thing that is totally within your control. Your mind is within your control only. I can't control how you think. I can't control what your mind rests on. But you control that. I control that for myself. You control that for yourself. And if your mind isn't resting on the right things, you can't blame that on your circumstances. You can't blame that on what somebody else is doing currently to you. You can't blame that on a difficult work situation. You can't blame that on the hurt of your past. If your mind is focused on wrong things, it's because you allow your mind to rest there. Gird up the loins of your mind. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Your mind has to lean upon the Lord. Paul said in Romans in chapter 8, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You've got to have a spiritual mind focused on God. Now, how do you do that? You look at the trials of your life and you say, God, they're there and they're visible and they hurt me. But you told me I'm supposed to think about you and not the trials. And so I choose to believe what you said. I'm going to focus my mind on the Lord. And dear brother or sister today, if you're living in anxiety here today, fearfully from one day to the next, uh, if you're never at rest, if you're constantly disquieted in your spirit, if you're on medication in a constant state of worry, I'm here to tell you, you're not spiritually minded. Because God just told you that to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You need to be spiritually minded. In the book of 2 Corinthians, another wonderful book in the New Testament, Paul said it this way. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. He said in that same context, he said, we're to be casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ he said, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay, I've noticed that when I drive, because I generally don't listen to music when I drive. Um, I'm not against it. I just generally don't do that. Uh, if I'm by myself and I'm driving, I generally am just, there's, it's silent. And I've noticed, <laughs> confession time, uh, I've noticed that when I'm driving in the quiet, I will oftentimes get angry. Now, it's because of stupid drivers. I mean, we know that's true. But I'll start getting angry, right? 
and then I'll start going through this whole process and I'll, I'll create a whole scenario, this whole fictional scenario, and how I responded, and how the police responded, and how this guy responded. I'm, I'm going through this on my mind, and for 15 minutes, I'm just getting angry at something that never happened. Surely you don't do that, but I do that, okay. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, why don't I just think about real things? Why don't I think about right things? Why don't I occupy my mind with something that's right? It's within my control. To be spiritually minded is peace. If my mind is focused and stayed and leaning upon the Lord, then I have peace in my life. I'm supposed to bring my thoughts into captivity. What am I thinking about? Why am I thinking about that? You understand? Listen, brethren, this is something that you can do. Bring your own thoughts into captivity. I'd ask you the question, are you overwhelmed by difficulties today? Is there pressure in life? Who amongst us doesn't have pressure in life? Maybe it's work or home, relationship, uh, financial pressure that you're facing. And God is telling you, I want you to direct your thoughts and lean your mind upon me in the middle of all this. I just want you to direct your thoughts on me. And our response as human beings is this, but I have to do something, right? I can't just sit here and do nothing. I'm in the midst of anxiety and worry and stress and problem. I must do something. And God said, no, what you have to do is focus your mind on me. Come back to me. There's nothing you can do with your hands. David said it this way in Psalm in chapter 56, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I'm not going to try to find something to do to fix the problem. I have to go to God to fix the problem. Do you understand there's nothing that you can do as a human being that will truly relieve the anxiety that you face in your life? You have to come back to the Lord with that. We sing this wonderful song. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Such a wonderful song. It's true. If your mind is stayed and fixed upon the Lord... There's peace. It comes back to what you do. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, Isaiah said, whose mind is stayed on thee. And notice this at the end of verse number three, because he trusteth in thee. Can I tell you this, lastly, that perfect trust brings perfect peace? Did you hear what I said? Perfect trust brings perfect peace. God is saying, uh, trust me. And really, this is where it boils down to for all of us. We, we can take our halos off and just be real for a moment with the Lord. It comes down to a matter of trust. The reason I'm filled with anxiety and I live in a state of fear and anxiety, my life is characterized by panic attacks. The reason? I don't trust what the Lord said. Now, he's told, he's told me very clearly that if I cast my burden on him, that he will sustain me because he won't suffer or allow me as a righteous man to be moved, to have my foundation shaken in life. He won't allow that to happen. He said, give me your burdens, I'll give you my peace. What a great transaction. But we don't do that and we live in anxiety and the reason is because we don't trust in him. But God clearly said, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. God says, if you trust in me, you will have peace. So I'm here to tell you, it's more than just lip service. It's not a statement we make that just magically, you know, makes everything all right. We have to have a trust in the Lord. Uh, I, could, I could have you turn to Philippians chapter 4. Many of you would know this passage. Be careful for nothing. Do you know that? Okay, careful means full of care. So be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So don't be full of care, but here's what you do. In everything in life, every issue, trial, anxiety, worry, panic, pray, be thankful to the Lord. What are we thankful to the Lord for? Generally, we're not thankful that we're in pain, but we're thankful that the Lord is here when we're in pain. He says, now you just let your request be made known to me. I know it already, God says, but I want you to say it. You come to me. You approach me in prayer with a heart of gratitude for who I am in the midst of your trial. And you let me know what your requests are. And here's what I'll do. I'll give you the peace of God. That's what he said in Philippians 4. 
and it passes your understanding. What it will do is it will keep, it will guard. Same word, protect, persevere you. It will guard your heart and mind. What God is saying is, trust me. What I said is right. The Bible is true. The character of God, as we see in the scripture, it's right. It's always right. God says, will you just trust me? I told me if you just, if you just take my yoke upon you, it's light. There's a light burden that comes with me. You don't have to carry your burden. I'll carry it for you. Trust me. You know that true confidence in God, it relieves the mind of anxiety. Okay, let me say that again, because sometimes our eyes glaze over in church. True confidence in God relieves the mind of anxiety. You can't be filled with anxiety when you have confidence in God. You can't have both at the same time. And so you must consider that the opposite is true as well, isn't it? Oftentimes, we've chosen to adopt the diagnosis of the world in dealing with our problems. And what we do is we kind of hide behind the mantra of mental health. We do. When we should be examining what our Heavenly Father says about it. When He says, be careful for nothing, can I ask you, who has that responsibility? We do. When He says to us here, let your requests be made known to God, um, who has that responsibility? We do. It's our responsibility here. Uh, Trusting God is a decision of your will. I choose to trust the Lord. Or I choose not to trust the Lord. There's no middle ground, dear friend. I trust Him or I don't trust Him. There's no middle ground. But if your anxiety and your depression uh, can only be held in by medication... You know what you're doing? Ultimately, you're transferring your spiritual responsibility to a drug that numbs the senses and changes the mood but doesn't solve the problem. And I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is. We have problems in life. But thanks be to God, he's given us a remedy for the problem. You know what the remedy is? It's him. He's the remedy. He says, just give it to me. But what we do is we go back to the baggage claim and we pull the bag off the carousel. And we walk around with the suitcases, the burdens of life, and we should have checked them in. But we carry them around with us all the time. Why? Because we don't trust him. And I know that can be confronting, but that's the reality of life. When we're living in a constant state of anxiety, the reason is we don't trust him. Because he said, if you give me Give your mind to me. Lean your mind upon me. I'll give you a perfect peace because you're trusting me. That's where it comes from. David said in Psalm 62, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. He said, God is a refuge for us. God is a refuge for us. You need to understand that peace isn't just a lack of strife. Peace is a mental well-being. It's not just a lack of a problem in the moment. It's the fact that that your mind mentally is resting on the Lord. And when you're there, it's a place of peace. And I can tell you, it's a wonderful place to be. And so Isaiah makes this bold statement. Verse number three. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. Now look at the last, the next verse as we close today. Here's the conclusion of the matter in verse four. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Here's the conclusion of the matter. God says, now you just, you just trust in me because I have strength. There's such a simplicity to the Christian life, isn't there? Everything that we've talked about this morning is very simple. It's not easy to do, but it's a simple process. God is just saying, now, you need to have an uninterrupted peace in your life. I can do that work. But the responsibility you have is to lean your mind upon me. And when you lean your mind upon me, what you're showing is that you trust me because I have strength. And brethren, that's God's remedy for perfect peace. I wonder as you're here today, uh, what's going on in your life that you need the peace of God? Things don't always work our way. 
relationships we have with people, they're not always the way we wish that they were. The circumstances of our life oftentimes take a left turn and we ask ourselves, how did we get here? I didn't look for this. I wasn't asking for this in my life. And we can face times of turmoil. That's common to all of us. But what do we do in the moment? Do we live in a constant state of fear and panic, a constant state of anxiety? Or do we turn over to the Lord and say, Lord, I just need perfect peace. And I realize it can only come from you. So I'm just going to trust you. It's a decision that you need to make. And dear friend, I pray that before you walk out of here today, you'd make that decision as a Christian. Lord, I'm just going to trust you. I think sometimes for us as believers, we need to confess our lack of trust in the Lord as the sin that it really is. Lord, forgive me for not trusting you. Forgive me for doubting that what you said in the Bible actually does apply to my life. It's not just some religious book, dear brethren. It's not just something that salves the conscience. Oh, I've done my religious duty. I've read a couple pages from a holy book. No, this is the, the eternal word of God that's meant for your life. It has value and purpose and relevance to you. And maybe for some of us, we just need to say, God, forgive me. I haven't been believing it, and so I haven't been acting on it. Now, lastly, I just want to say this to you before we dismiss today. There may be somebody here and you don't have peace with God. The Bible says it this way, that when you don't know Jesus Christ as your own Savior from sin, that you are the enemy of God. That's how God sees you. You may not know yourself to be in that situation, but that's how God sees you. It's a dangerous place to be. And you might be here today, and maybe you're interested in Christianity, and you've maybe never heard the message of the gospel. And maybe this is the first time you've heard that the way God views you is as an enemy because you're not forgiven of your sin. You need to have peace with God. How does a person, man or woman, how do they find the peace with God? Here's how you find it. You accept the sacrifice that God made of himself for your sin. God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. The creator God came to this world in the form of the very men that he had created. God who became flesh. And he came so that he could give his life as a ransom for our sin. Uh, as all of us as individuals, we deserve the judgment of God because of our sin. Everything that we've done in our life that we knew wasn't wrong, we did by choice. And because of that choice of sin in our life, there must be a consequence. And the consequence for our sin is an eternity in a place called the lake of fire. But God said that he wasn't willing that any person should perish, but that all people would have repentance. In other words, they would recognize that their own self-righteousness or the things that they thought were good enough, God says it's not good enough. You have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died, and hear me today, who rose from the dead. And he offers you the gift of everlasting life. He'll forgive you and he'll give you everlasting life. Only in that way can you find peace with God. I wonder, are you here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior? I might be talking to a church member today. And you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior from sin. Do you have peace with God? You can know him personally and have peace with him today. Our gracious Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the, the simplicity of it, for the help that it can bring to us. And now I ask, Lord, in these quiet moments as we close, that you would help your people, first of all, Lord, who need to have the peace of God in their life. I know that many people here today are, are in trials and difficulties not caused by sin or wrong decisions, but just the way life goes. And they need the peace of God in all of this. And I pray that they would, they would find through the truth of what Isaiah said that they can have an uninterrupted peace, even in the middle of a storm. Oh God, help them to learn that they can trust you if they're just leaning their mind on you and focusing on the thing that you said, which is yourself. But then, Father, I pray if there's one here today who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that they'd find today the peace with God that they need, forgiveness from their sin. Oh, God, please do a work amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name. With our heads bowed for just a moment, I want to ask you the question, um, are you here today without Christ? 
Is there anybody here that would say, Pastor, I don't know if I died that I would go to heaven. I don't know. And the truth is, I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to have peace with God. Are you here today? Nobody's looking around, but I'm looking at you, and I just want to know, can I pray for you? Would there be anybody here today? You'd raise your hand and say, Preacher, that's me. Please pray for me. I don't know, and I want to know. Anybody? Preacher, pray for me. I don't know. How do I have peace with God? Well, Christian, you might need the peace of God today. Could I just invite you to come to him as the Prince of Peace? Cast your burden upon the Lord. He'll, he truly will sustain you. Maybe you need to ask him to forgive you for your lack of trust. I just encourage you for just a moment to seek the Lord and find his peace in the storm of life.